Hello, everyone, and welcome to ML Don. So today um, we are having an interview with Professor Carl Frissen. Uh, Professor Frissen is a theoretical neuroscientist and a world renowned authority on brain imaging. Uh, he has invented statistical parametric mapping, or SPM, which is a software package designed for the analysis of brain imaging data sequences. And also, uh, I think his main contribution uh, to theoretical neurobiology is uh, the free energy principle for action and perception that hopefully we'll get the time to also explore. Professor Frisson, thank you so much for, for being with us, uh, with us today. My pleasure. Um, okay. Um, so let's just get started. The free energy principle, right? Um, could you just tell us about what the free energy principle is and how has it enriched our understanding of the brain as a unifying brain theory, if you will? Right. So I normally respond to that question by asking whether you want the sort of the high road or the low road approach to um, <laughs> understanding what the free energy principle is about. Um, I'll very briefly try to surmise both. So the low road, uh, which is like a sort of bottom-up way of understanding it, which is a kind of way that I think a lot of um, neuroscientists and psychologists would understand things, or more broadly, uh, people in neurobiology, um, would be the denouement at the present time of very old and um, compelling ideas about the brain as literally a fantastic organ, a, a, an organ that constructs hypotheses, explanations, fantasies that afford the best explanation for all the sensory impressions, all the sensory data that we have to assimilate and literally make sense of. Um, so the principles that underwrite that perspective were articulated in various disciplines by people like Kant and Helmholtz, people like Richard Gregory, analysis by synthesis, um, perception as hypothesis making, leverage to great uh, effect in machine learning uh, with people like uh, Jeffrey Hinton and Peter Diane and their notion of the Helmholtz machine, in turn borrowing technical ideas from the physics and engineering literature such as Feynman's uh, free energy principle as a way of writing down a prescription or a normative account of this kind of sense making. And you end up with a, uh, a, a formal first principle account of sense making, which you can write down as a computer program or you can write down mathematically, that essentially casts the brain as in the service of trying to minimize its variational free energy. And you can read variation free energy here essentially is a kind of prediction error technically the free energy gradients are prediction errors and so what's a prediction error well it's just the difference between what given your beliefs about the current state of affairs out there beyond the skull bound brain what would i expect to see what would i predict and then i compare my predictions with what i'm actually sensing and that constitutes a prediction error and then i use the prediction error to drive my beliefs in a way that eliminates that prediction error. So I've got a sufficient account of what's going on. And that's often referred to as predictive processing in its inactive form or active inference. Um, and when we're drilling down just on the perceptual synthesis that is a, you know, afforded by this account, um, it, the most popular scheme that would be predictive coding, sort of the uh, reciprocal exchange of top-down predictions from the inside out to the parts of the brain dealing with sensory processing uh, that is complemented by a, an ascending outside-in flow of prediction errors where you need the predictions to form the prediction errors and then the predictions or the expectations they, that are generating those predictions um, um, are informed and updated by the prediction errors. Technically that's a process called uh, Bayesian belief updating, hence the Bayesian brain uh, and the Helmholtz machine um, formulations of it. So that would be an account of the free energy principle really as a prescription, um, an algorithm, um, a teleological account of a normative theory for the brain as an active organ um, making sense of data 
with the key twist that of course the brain or you and I are in charge of the data that we're trying to make sense of. So there's a, an added inactivist twist here. It's not just that we're good Bayesian filters or data assimilators. We actively have to decide what kind of data we want to base our inferences upon. Um, you know, literally in terms of where I was, where I'm going to look next, how I visually palpate the world, or you know, which news channels to listen to, or which Wikipedia page I'm going to forage, forage next. That, you know, so that that's possibly more um, more of a difficult problem the brain has to solve than just simply making sense of the data. But both are bound up in this um, in this sort of generic account in terms of free energy minimization or the explaining away and accounting for providing the best explanation that eliminates, uh, eliminates prediction errors. Very briefly, the high road is the kind of uh, approach um, that a physicist would uh, take. Um, and you can derive exactly the same mechanics of belief updating, the same sort of um, explanation for sentient behavior, where behavior is important because that's the active part. Uh, just from an analysis of things that exist in uh, in the sense of physics, um, and the particular physics here is the physics of non uh, non equilibrium steady state uh, systems systems that that have the uh, the the remarkable property of returning to states that they were once in you know, mathematically have attracting sets or characteristic states of being that, you know, I um, am found at this temperature in this kind of location and this sort of environment. Uh, so all the things that would characterize me represent states that I keep on revisiting. And that can be written down mathematically in terms of the, um, the dynamical system theory of attracting sets. Um, you can work out the probability distributions or you can appeal to Feynman's work on path integral formulations um, to work out, well, if things exist, then what properties, what dynamics must they have been, must they possess in order to exist uh, and to maintain themselves in within these viable states of being. So in the life sciences, this would be known as autopoiesis or self-creation in the uh, computational chemistry of the self-assembly, how do molecules assemble themselves and re retain their sort of morphology and structural or configurational um, organization. Um, and it turns out that you end up with exactly the same equations that you're trying to, you know, everything that we do, either on the inside or in terms of acting upon the world is in the service of minimizing this uh, variational proxy for um, prediction error, um, but also mathematically happens to be um, the quantity that uh, statisticians would try to optimize, namely the marginal likelihood or the evidence for models of the world. So you get this sort of um, teleological account um, that systems that self-organize look as if they're trying to maximize the evidence for their models of the world. And sometimes people refer to that as, as self-evidencing. So that would be a philosophical account of the top-down physicists explanation for the way that you and I actively organize our exchanges with the lived world in order to, uh, in order to exist and maintain our existence, um, a sort of generalized homeostasis that can be described mathematically as a minimization of um, variational free energy. Okay, uh, very, very interesting. So uh, as far as I understand, uh, so we are, it, it's about, as you said, we, we're trying to sort of do actions that would maximize the probability of our existence of our, the model that we have from the, the, the environment that we're living in. Um, so, which is, I think, the same thing that uh, that you refer to as marginal likelihood. Yes. Uh, the probability of uh, observation given the model that I currently have um, of the of the world. Um, what I'm trying to understand is trying to marry that idea with the with the other idea that the brain selects which kind of which one of these inputs to consider, like how to affect the environment, because. When we say the probability of 
my input from my receptors, given the model I have from, uh, from the environment, it is as if I have a control of what I will necessarily do. Because I mean, there are so many receptions coming. I might choose to ignore some of them, but then it might not be the right choice. Also, when you talk about optimization, I realize that now, from a, if, if I look at this from a machine learning perspective, since we are optimizing, could we overfit I mean, <laughs> and fail to generalize? <laughs> okay. Well, that's a great question. There are about there are about um, there are about four great questions in the. Oh, in sorry, the, sorry. No, no, pick, no. Pick, pick no, one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> full attention. Um, so, first of all, just to clear, yeah, I am sorry. I will use technical um, terms um, uh, with with very little theory of mind because I'm so used to to doing so. So you're absolutely right. The marginal likelihood is nothing magical. It's just the probability that. Um, these sensory data would be solicited, experienced um, under my model of how those data were generated. You're absolutely right. The marginal bit comes from um, marginalizing out over or averaging our, um, over the unknown parameters of a generative model, but we don't need to worry about that. You know, the model evidence is the marginal likelihood um, and the logarithm of that is the is, is negative free energy. Um, but your more interesting question, I mean, if you now um, review when, you know, this, this podcast um, and just listen to the words you use, they're very telling, sort of, you're talking about selection, that's a great word to use. You also said I, you know, so immediately there's, a, there's a, a, an, an inactive, a gentle aspect to your question. So a predictive coding scheme that's just assimilating data and making sense of data, has no notion of, of me, has no selfhood, and certainly doesn't have any, it is not equipped with the ability to choose and to select which data it wants to actually assimilate or to classify or to categorize. So we're going beyond machine learning now. We are going beyond um, simply passively um, um, in a sort of um, outside in way, making sense of data. We are now asking about this really deep question, how on earth do we select the data to assimilate? So the answer is very simple. Um, in the same spirit that um, everything on the inside that's doing this assimilation has to minimize the prediction error, sometimes cast in terms of surprise in a technical sense. So this, this is, if you're an information theoretician, this would be the self-information. Um, the, the if you're doing that then the natural question then arises well look what happens if i'm in control of the data that i can i can now select or turn towards well now i have to um, choose the actions that will produce data that are have the minimum expected surprise or the minimum expected prediction error so if surprise which is another word for a, a mathematical uh, expression for this um, uh, bound on surprise or evidence called, called variation free energy um, is um, the thing in the moment. Then after I have, have acted in the future, then what I want to do is to minimize my expected surprise, my expected prediction error. So what's that? Well, expected surprise is, is um, technically uh, entropy. Um, and more anthropomorphically, uh, this would be just uncertainty. So what you're doing is, if you're subscribing to the free energy principle, and you now have to choose the best kind of act or sampling uh, or selection, um, uh, then you would select those actions that minimize your uncertainty, that resolve your uncertainty, Another way of expressing that mathematically is that they have the greatest information gain, that those kinds of data resolve my uncertainty more than those kinds of data. So that's a actually a well-known Bayesian principle, um, and it's um, often cast in terms of optimal Bayesian design uh, and has been known um, um, since the 1950s through the work of people like Lindley. Uh, there are well-defined objective functions, which are simply how much do I shrink my uncertainty? Um, 
technically measured in terms of a divergence mathematically, but you know, we just need to know the information gain is just the degree to which I, I shrink my uncertainty about uh, states of affairs out there. So what that means is that we are, uh, if we minimize, if we choose those actions, or we want to minimize our free energy, then we have to choose those actions that minimize the expected free energy, which necessarily makes us into curious creatures. Now, you're, you were saying to me, I don't know how to do that. I don't know, understand how to do that. You do. You're a scientist. Uh, even if you don't have a PhD, every, every child and every student and every, every adult is a curious scientist. They want to know how their world works. Either it's your scientific field of study or if you're a little baby, it's just how your body works. You know, what kind of thing is mum? Is mum you know, the same kind of thing as me? All of this information um, has to be carefully selected in order to resolve uncertainty about this hypothesis or that hypothesis in exactly the same way that you would design a good experiment. So the, when you design an experiment, then you design the experiment to yield data that are going to be maximally informative in relation to your null versus alternate hypothesis. So it's exactly the same principle governs the selection of natural experiments that we deploy with our eyes, looking over there or looking over there. It's exactly the same mathematics, it's the same imperatives, and indeed um, you actually see the same information theoretic constructs emerging in the visual search literature in the neurosciences. Um, you can construe these as salience maps that, you know, they score the uncertainty reduction, the epistemic affordance of making that, select, selecting those data by, by looking over there or by, again, looking at this Wikipedia page or listening to this news channel and not that fake news channel. Um, so it's a great question because not only does it, um, does it make, the, I think, the really profound point that, that curiosity of all kinds is baked in to the first principle account of self-organization, that anything that exists must in part be acting or appear to act, look as if it is acting to resolve uncertainty about the exchanges with its eco niche, its environment, its culture, or the visual scene, um, the visual scene at hand. Furthermore, because you're talking about action, it's you that's acting. So it's, it, there's, there's an implicit sense of, um, of agency that is owned by the artifact in question. So we're now talking about something that would be necessary to equip an agent with some a very elemental selfhood. The third thing it brings to the table is, is really commonsensical, but it's, 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 a, it's, I think, a very interesting observation. Um, that in order to select this action over that action, then I have to have a model of the consequences of my action. But the consequences live in the future, which says that your generative models now must cover the future, which means that you've got something that a lot of things in this universe don't have, which is a model of the future. It has temporal depth. So, you know, that you could apply the free energy principle to a thermostat. You could apply it to a virus and it would work perfectly well. You could simulate thermostats and indeed make a thermostat uh, or simulate a virus um, or possibly even construct one. Um, but these kind, the generative models that you would use that has to be in place in order to work out the surprise due to the predictions generated by that model um, would not have the temporal depth of the models that you and I have. Um, so as soon as you talk about selection, you're talking about essentially selecting a plan of action, a course of action, and, of, and that means necessarily rolling out into the future. So your generative models have this temporal depth. And furthermore, as soon as you entertain the notion that I could do this or that, then there is an act of selection in play. The thermostat doesn't have that. There's only one thing it can do because it acts in the moment. But you and I are very, have a very much more... Uh, a deeper generative model that we bring to the table that, that allows now to set a, among series, a series of counterfactual courses of action. You can choose what to say next or not to say anything at all. Um, and in that choice, there is an act of Bayesian 
technically an act of Bayesian model selection or policy selection. So now you've got thermostats that select, provided they have these deep generative models that, that sort of free you from the moment because they're, they're really about trajectories and paths, you know, how we navigate the lived world. Uh, and the about the overfitting thing. Oh, um, yes. Could we overfit? Yes. That, or, or, or actually, why don't we overfit? Maybe right. that's the right question. That's a really good question. Uh, yeah, that was a, the fourth clever part of your question. Right? Yeah. <laughs> the reason you don't overfit, and, uh, and I'll probably, um, if you indulge me, I'll answer this from the point of view of sort of machine learning um, or statistics. So um, the answer here um, lies in an understanding of the nature of models and their evidence. So the first thing to say is that there is no true model of the world. There is no, um, there is a best model of the world and that's simply the model that has the greatest evidence, but there's no true model of the world. There are, you know, there are, all, there are many, many ways of explaining um, um, how some data for us, sensory data um, was generated and uh, you know, providing an account of that. All we can do is find the one that has the greatest evidence the greatest marginal likelihood, the greatest probability of the data under that model. So we can change the model and until the model provides or account gives you the greatest marginal likelihood. So what is evidence? And th this is the key point. Evidence is accuracy minus complexity, which means that to find the model with the greatest evidence is to provide an account of these data in the simplest way possible. And that simplicity underwrites the ability to generalize. In the absence of that complexity part of the model evidence, you would certainly overfit. So if you did, if you were allowed to use as many degrees of freedom um, as uh, you wanted with no constraints on that, i.e. no complexity constraints, you would certainly overfit these data so that the next day's data um, would uh, not be expendable because you'd ex you'd fit all the little random effects and fluctuations in the in the data at hand. So that complexity term is absolutely crucial in ensuring that maximizing model evidence, minimizing surprise, minimizing free energy, all of these are statements essentially of the same thing, um, goes hand in hand with an automatic penalty on the complexity that precludes overfitting. And it's really interesting just to sort of unpack what complexity is here. So um, on, a, on, a, um, on a technical account, the complexity is basically the degree to which I change my mind having seen some data. So technically it's the difference between some posterior Bayesian beliefs, some probability, just a probabilistic explanation, um, for some causes of some data in machine learning, this might be called some the latent states generating unobservable latent states, hidden states uh, that are generating observable measurements or observations or, or sensory, um, sensory input from our perspective. Um, so I've got two um, beliefs. Before we were talking about this process of dynamically reducing free energy or minimizing prediction error as a process of belief updating. That belief updating is literally updating a prior belief before I see data into a posterior belief after I've seen a posteriori, after I've seen the data. And the degree to which you have to move your belief from the prior to the posterior is the complexity. So it's the degrees of freedom that you're using up in explaining the data. Now, if you've got really good prior beliefs, you don't have to change your mind very much. And therefore you can provide an accurate account of this data with a minimal complexity cost because you've moved your belief updating has been extremely efficient and minimally complex. So it is those kinds of high evidence generative models that have this complexity penalty in place that are able to generalize to new data because you've got the right kind of priors. So it all goes hand in hand. And it's a really important point that, you know, I don't know, I, I'm wondering whether you knew this already in virtue of the fact you asked the question, but you know, th this, this, this issue is really um, 
uh, you know, a difficult issue uh, in conventional machine learning, because you know if you just look at the way the field has gone in machine learning, they've gone to sort of big data, you know, sort of you know, committing to the the um, ideology of you know big data science uh, with massively overparameterized neural networks. So if you read a neural network as a generative model, certainly in the context say, of an autoencoder, um, then what you're starting with is an overly parameterized, overly complex generative model, um, which can beautifully explain any given data set, but is hopeless in generalizing to another context or, an, or, or some new data, simply because the complexity is too high, because there are too many parameters in that model, which only say connection weights in a, in a recurrent neural network or a convolutional neural network or a variational autoencoder. So the, the, you know, what that leads to then is um, all sorts of problems with sharp minima um, um, that ensue because you have not put in the, the complexity term um, that you can think of in terms of just Occam's principle. You know, so Occam's principle has to get into the objective function. So if you've got, so the game now it would be to take a neural network in machine learning, say in deep learning, and try and find out which connection weights or which, you know, what architectural aspects of your neural network you didn't need to provide an accurate account, which is actually the opposite direction of travel from most of deep learning at the moment, which are aspiring to more parameters with bigger computers. Um, there's an interesting little twist there, of course, that um, there are a number of um, uh, fundamental principles, um, such as Landauer's principle, the Jasinski equality, which um, effectively say that information is energy and energy is information. Um, and in this present context, the degree of belief updating as scored by the complexity cost has a thermodynamic cost, which means if you're recognizing things properly and selecting the right things to do properly with the minimum of complexity, you're doing it with the greatest thermodynamic efficiency. So you can measure the quality of any artifact, any neural network or neuronal network, simply by the amount of energy it has to expend to exist. So again, you know, the drive towards high performance computing is exactly in the wrong direction. What you're looking for is sort of um, sentient edge computing like devices based upon a, um, an evidence maximization or free energy minimization approach that should do it um, like your brain, which would consume the same energy as a light bulb as opposed to a power station. So that's a really good question. This, you know, uh, you know, that has some really pragmatic engineering, um, computer engineering and uh, sort of, you know, um, energetics uh, associated with it and explains to a great extent why you're so much better than any neural network that lives on a, you know, a, a, a high performance computer at, at the moment. The idea of um, overfitting and overparameterized models um, just reminded me of this paper uh, by Professor Mikhail Belkin. Um, so it's, it's, a, it, it's a paper about this phenomenon that happens in overparameterized models called the double descend, as they've called it. Now, their question was why overparameterized models don't overfit? And just why why can, why they can do why, why they can generalize so well, and it's it's an it's a very interesting paper. It was really shocking to me because we have this famous uh, I mean in machine learning we have this famous U shaped sort of uh, you know plot that shows that okay the more you parameterize your model, the the um, well the error in the, the, the error in your in the predictions of your model keeps going down and down and down. And after a certain point, it fails to generalize. So it just keeps going high and higher and higher and higher. Now, what they did was they didn't stop there. They kept adding more parameters. They kept adding more and more. Now, what happened then was after a certain point, uh, we have a double descent, a second descent in the generalization ability uh, or in the error, let's say the prediction error. It again keeps going down and down and down. In some cases, it goes even below the point 
where the, 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 the minimum of the first descent. It, it could even get to a better generalization. And in some cases, no, it, it, the minimum that it could ever reach would not be as good as the minimum of, of the first descent. So they've called this double descent and I, I'm trying to, and didn't happen, the double descent always happened based on their experience. They use it with decision trees, they use it with uh, neural networks and a couple more models. I, I don't remember exactly what they were, but um, the, the, idea, the notion of accuracy minus complexity and that being the idea of that being the reason as to why uh, we don't overfit. I'm trying to uh, sort of mix, like to have that next to the idea of, because their, their argument was that when you have too much, too many number of parameters, the model sort of goes towards, like you have, you have more knobs to control your search in the hypothesis space. You, you inevitably go to, you, as if you can, you, can, you can search better. And then you find maybe, I think they were arguing that you find simpler solutions, I think, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, how, how would you marry that idea with the idea, with this accuracy minus complexity being the reason of not overfitting? Um, right, <laughs> that's a very, a very <laughs> question, that one. Okay. So um, I think if you think of this, um, the problem in terms of um, finding minima in a, an objective function landscape, um, then um, that, that phenomenon of double descent makes entire sense in the context of escaping local minima. So let's assume that we've basically got um, a difficult problem, say a brittle dynamical system or a highly nonlinear problem where the objective function, let's assume it's a, a, you know, a, um, um, either um, a, a free energy uh, objective function or some approximation to it, um, then it's likely you're going to have lots of local minima around. And you know, one instance and one particularly problematic aspect um, you know, that probably you, 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 you have in mind is this notion of sharp minima, the minima that have very steep sides that are very difficult to escape from with any sort of stochastic annealing or any sort of um, um, device that would sort of uh, bring you out of that base of attraction of that sharp minima. Um, so um, the first point to make before I pursue that analogy and really basically just reiterate the solution that you, you've actually just, just described, which is absolutely correct. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll do it you know, from, a, from a, um, a dynamical perspective. Um, the first point to make is that the, the failure to uh, put the complexity term into the objective functions used by typically by lots of vanilla machine learning, not all, I mean, high-end, uh, um, so variational autoencoders, use exactly the variational free energy, um, or, uh, which is um, in machine learning, there is an evidence lower bound or an elbow. That is exactly the same um, uh, objective function we're talking about. Um, but those, uh, um, uh, those uh, algorithms do, that don't do that and just try to maximize the likelihood as opposed to the marginal likelihood. So you know, just try to maximize the accuracy such you know, as scored by the, the sum of squared residuals, for example. So they're forgetting about the complexity and they're just drilling down the accuracy part of it to create these, create these sharp minima. Uh, the reason that these minima are sharp is that the complexity term creates it into a U-shaped minimum. And this is, if you like, one expression of Occam's principle, that the good, ex the good, the good explanations have to allow for some latitude. Um, so the curvature of the minima scores the, um, um, the, um, the latitude you have in the sense that you're not committing to a very particular explanation that provides an accurate account of these data. Uh, there are a number of ways of, of, of understanding this. One of them is in fact, from the point of view of uh, James's maximum entropy principle, that under constraints afforded by say a likelihood and some priors on the generative model, the best explanation is always the belief that has the maximum entropy, which is, means it has the, the minimum curvature in some uh, free energy landscape. So the free energy functional 
provides an objective function where all the minima are flat, thereby eluding the sharp minima problem that, is, that um, plagues most conventional machine learning. So I think that's the first thing to recognize that you will find those free energy minima um, more efficiently provided you can escape the local minima, simply because the free energy minima are always flat and then they're, they're less likely to trap you. Um, so let's now take what, well, what, are, what other ways uh, could you escape sharp minima um, that are local minima that are high in a free energy landscape? So just uh, so one sort of picture I use for, for, for my students is, is, is very much like a mountain range um, that is the genesis of a little stream that turns into a river. So the lower you get in the landscape, the wider the rivers, the shallower the valleys until ultimately you get to an estuary. And so exactly the same sort of, if you like, um, landscape exists in a free energy or racial free energy concept, context. So stuff high up, uh, you know, uh, uh, all the sharp minima that have a very undesirable high free energy um, are the rough stuff in the higher mountains. And your job is to get down, uh, flow down to the nice shallow um, global minima that are much that have this um, this sort of maximum entropy Occam's principle um, shallowness to them with low curvature. So how might you want to get out of those high hanging valleys, those, those sharp minima? Well, you, you've said it basically. If you imagine from the point of view of dynamical systems theory, flows on a, um, on a manifold or a, um, uh, in this instance, a free energy landscape, let's imagine we just got one parameter to play with. So, and we've found ourselves in a V-shaped um, uh, minima and we can't get out of it. But if I add another dimension and now make my one dimensional um, objective function two dimensional, then I can change that fixed point attractor that corresponds to the point or the, the, minim, the local minimum in question into a saddle point, into an unstable fixed point, and I can escape from it. So now I've got a saddle point where there are now routes away from that local minimum. Of course, as you keep on adding dimensions, i.e. adding parameters to your model, the opportunities for converting a stable fixed point, which is a, a local minima, into an unstable fixed point from which you can escape increases geometrically, or at least superlinearly. So I think that's the explanation in conversation with people in machine learning. Uh, and I enjoyed one such conversation with people um, at NYU uh, just a couple of weeks ago. I, you know, I think that that is, is, is probably the story that you would tell to account for this sort of throwing lots and lots of parameters um, at a model just to destroy stable fixed points that constitute local minima so that you can access the global minima. And then once you've done that, you then prune away all the parameters that you use as your escape routes to get back to the simple model. So what we're talking about, I think this uh, double descent thing is a really lovely notion. Um, and it does remind me a little bit of how the brain works in the sense that you know, it starts off with an overly parameterized um, generative model. So babies and children actually have more connections. They have more Ws, um, more um, external connections, white matter tracts than, uh, than adolescents and than you and I do. So you get this progressive pruning as you grow older. So you start off with this overly parameterized, overly complex virgin um, tabula rasa, where you can escape all the local minima. And then as time goes on, you then do your pruning and reduce the number of parameters or connection, uh, connection weights in, in, your, uh, in your model to, to simplify, to, to uh, in accord with James's Max Venture principle or Comes principle uh, from the point of view of the free energy minimization. It's the complexity part of the minimization. So you now get a smaller parameter model, but you've only done the second wave of descent, if you like, after you've escaped all the, all the local minima by having an overly parameterized model. So I'm sure that that's, you know, this must be a universal principle that I suspect is so universal, it has been discovered by evolution, uh, you know, um, <laughs> millions of years yeah. ago. Yeah, yeah. 
that was that was amazing wow that was a totally different perspective that the 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 i mean the reduction in the number of parameters as you grow old i i, I never i've never thought about that first of all i didn't know that but it was it was really amazing yeah well it has its penalties because i am much older than you and therefore i'm much sparser and wiser than you but i could not adapt to a new world so i can't go bungee jumping or go to disco oh my god so it's wow uh, wow wow mind-boggling I, I don't know what to say that was that was really enlightening actually um so it seems to me that uh there are two methods of learning in general when it comes to biological systems so i did a little bit of research on this i don't know whether i'm right or or not but i could narrow this down to two general methods um one is perceptual inference where and the other one is through action inference now, the perceptual inference, I, I suppose, is when you generate a model from the world and you keep updating that, the parameters, whereas the action one is where you actually choose actions. Um, so I know we've discussed this a, um, a little bit at the beginning of the interview, but could you explain these two methods in more detail and uh, and compare them as to in what situation Am I learning through perceptual inference? And in what situation do I choose to learn through action inference? Right, yeah, it does, I think, speak to this issue of sort of um, um, machines with agency that we were talking about before, artifacts that have sentient behavior. So the sentient part would be the perceptual inference and the behavior would, would be the active inference. Um, I think that they, you know, once you think about sort of artifacts that do actively exchange with the world, I think they both have to go uh, hand in hand. So, um, I, you know, I think it's, although another excellent question, I will qualify my answer after I've given you the vanilla answer, which is, you know, these are, this is just a joint optimization process over two kinds of unknowns, two kinds of latent states out there that generate data. One kind of latent state is the latent states over which I have no control. So this would be the standard data assimilation, classification problem, recognition problem. I am given some data and I have to classify, learn its causal structure, infer the particular state generating, latent state generating these data in this particular context. So that would be perceptual synthesis, perceptual inference, um, learning the parameters um, of that gender model, I would call um, perceptual learning. So I, in my world, I distinguish between fast processes that infer time dependent states and slow processes that infer the parameters that underlie the contingencies and the laws um, which would be learning in the machine learning sense. So the, the W's in a, in, a, in a neural network, but the states of the network at any one point in time, I would interpret as inference. Um, you know, this is the activity of these nodes and therefore I'm seeing this kind of face. So that's one set of unknowns, but there's another hugely important set of unknowns, latent states out there, those which I can control, those which I have some agency over. So if I make this movement or I secrete this or I switch on this knob, then the states out there will also change. If that's the case, then you're now conditioning a certain set of hidden states on latent states, which can be thought of as plans or control variables. So the U in a you know, sort of uh, uh, a standard machine learning treatment. Um, so these control variables or uh, say in, in control theory, uh, theory, now play a really important role because the transitions the dynamics amongst the latent states um, that are controllable are now conditioned upon this U, but this U is another random variable. This means I have to infer two sets of random variables. I have to infer the latent states over which I have no control, and I also have to infer the, um, the, um, the control variables, if you like, the plans um, upon which the variables, the states that I do have control over are conditioned. So there's two kinds of inference here, which you can think of in terms of the distinction between someone just applying a Kalman filter to uh, estimate the states of some plant 
versus um, estimating the best thing to do if you were, you were doing applying control theory and then, you know when you're controlling a particular plant, say in, in engineering. Um, but because we're now committed to understanding everything in terms of optimizing a free energy functional of beliefs or probability distributions, that now becomes that that planning or control theoretic part of the problem, the active inference part of the problem, now becomes planning as inference. So, the, you know, in a sense, you can read um, the two perceptual and active sides of inference as really the same process working hand in hand in parallel. Um, the, uh, uh, but acknowledging there are two different kinds of variables that you, you, you have to infer, you have to work out basically what's the state of affairs out there and what am I doing about it? And then, of course, you can see now that the active inference side, the, um, the planning as inference, now has to consider a number of plausible plans. And then we get back to selecting the, um, the most likely plan, which minimizes the expected free energy or resolves the greatest uncertainty or avoids surprising outcomes like you know, um, your, your machine crashing if you're in an autonomous driving uh, situation. So you can write in uh, all your prior preferences into that um, expected free energy in the future, conditioned upon the plan. So I would I would say that that um, uh, that that sort of you know there is no choice to do active inference means that you have to infer both the latent states of the world and the way that you're intervening and uh, on those states through controlling state transitions that just means planning as inference that's part and parcel of of of, of active inference of just being and being um, existing in a world that you're continually sampling and it's continually generating data for you to make sense of there's you know there's a circular causality there the the the, the, the sort of um, the twist here um the qualification is that I think you're absolutely right that, that in fact we do switch between that active and perceptual inference in reality. So if I was building an artifact, I probably wouldn't worry about what I'm about to say. But if I wanted to describe you and me, I would describe you and me as basically machines that are built to, um, in a solitary way, in an intermittent way, alternatively plan an action and execute it and then gather some data and then make perceptual inferences or you know do the perceptual learning side of things so i mean this in the sense that um the way that we the temporal scheduling and the alternation between the action and the, per, the, the perception or the active inference and the perceptual inference the way that it seems to be scheduled and organized in biological artifacts like like ourselves is that every 250 milliseconds, about four times a second, we act. And within those actions, we do our perceptual synthesis. So this, you'll see this, you know, um, for example, every 250 milliseconds, about four times a second, you will move your eyes with saccadic eye movements. So you're, you're getting little snapshots every 250 milliseconds at four hertz. Um, and during the acquisition, during the action, you actually switch off your sensory channels. It's called saccadic suppression. Um, if you're an engineer, you're basically turning the Kalman gain down to zero when you're doing the action bit. Um, so you don't see the optical flow induced by your eye movements. You just don't see that. What you see is the thing that you've actually fixated on and you, you, uh, uh, you use that to construct a scene, you assimilate, you build, you build up uh, you know, this illusion that the, you know, there's, there's a visual scene out there. But in fact, in reality, you're getting little snapshots from here and here at about four hertz. The way that you speak, if you think about, or just listen to me, uh, the way that you, you hear things, um, well, that's not quite so true, but certainly the way that you, um, you um, fulfill your proprioceptive predictions during speech, all my phonemes are roughly 250 milliseconds long. So I'm just producing a, second, a, you know, a discrete sequence of little packages of phonemes every 250 milliseconds. If I was a mouse, I would sample, make sample my world by whisking my whiskers. And the frequency of that is 250 milliseconds or four hertz. 
And if you now look at the belief updating um, on the inside, which would correspond to the perceptual inference, making sense of the data sampled by my whisking around my burrow, um, you see again this profound theta rhythm that dominates an active exploration of the environment that within it is nested all the fast perceptual belief updating, usually at what's called a gamma frequency, about 40 hertz. So you've got this lovely separation of time scales where we make a move on the world at uh, you know, four times a second. We get some data and then we quickly process what that means. When we've reached a conclusion, then we go off and get the next bit of data and then we process this. So for artifacts like you and me, um, there is actually, I think, a temporal separation of the active part and the, the, the perceptual part, part, part of inference. So I'm waiting to see until they build that into robots, because I think you get very realistic um, behaviours and the way that people respond to things and, you know, orientate to things or understand things through this sort of discretization or quanti quantization of discrete packets of information that live within, say, you know, a few hundred milliseconds, and you know, and that dictates the temporal scheduling of at least biological uh, belief updating. Wow, unbelievable! That was amazing. So it, it it feels like there is no parallelization. There's actually very fast switching between yeah. the two, um, like a joint optimization. Yes. yes. Uh, that, that you, you know, I, just to quite, you know, if I was building a computer, I wouldn't do that. It's just that obviously there's a better way of doing it, and evolution has found that this sort of uh, this fast switching is, is the best way to do it. In the to explain the kinds of worlds in which we live in, you know, where biological motion has certain time constants, where you know meteorological events or things around us change at a certain time scale, it's clearly the most efficient way, uh, you know, according to evolution anyway, or basically. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Wow. That was amazing. So, uh, so we, we keep, we, we've kept talking about active inference and of all the actions that I could choose, I'm choosing the one that on average would maximize or say minimize the surprise in the future or minimize the free energy. Um, I'm trying to think as to, so first of all, it, it requires I suppose, I don't know whether the word is, my wording is right or wrong, but some sort of a knowledge about the future, as you said, it, it requires a look into the future. Um, I can't help but notice uh, that there is a similarity between active inference and reinforcement learning. However, in reinforcement learning, what we do is we have the ultimate, we, like we have a, a, an end goal, an end state, and we just let the machine do whatever it's, it wants to do, rant, like exploration, exploitation, whatever it wants to do, many, many, many times. So eventually it has a way to backpropagate the expected reward to the current state. But a human being that say it's experiencing something for the first time and wants to choose the action, uh, I don't, I don't, it doesn't have that, that, that option, right? Yes. So first of all how would you differentiate between active inference and reinforcement learning and second of all um let, let's just discuss this i, I forgot the, the the second question uh let's just discuss this uh, first uh, the difference between active inference and uh, reinforcement learning yeah i, I relieve because that's a very big question <laughs> okay <laughs> 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 but feel free to prepare the next one while we're, while we're dealing with this. Okay, one. perfect. <clears throat> so um, there are a number of ways of answering that question. And the simplest way, of course, is, is to look um, at what is on the tin when you pick up active inference versus reinforcement learning. One's about inference and one is about learning. So um, active inference has in it inference and learning, which has the important consequence that you have um, beliefs not just about the um, states of the world, but also beliefs about the parameters of your generative model. So it comes equipped with beliefs about the Ws in, say, a, a neural network. Um, reinforcement learning is just about learning the parameters. You could look at reinforcement learning um, as a mechanism to enable machines to learn to infer 
and in part I think that's how people often um, understand inference in the context of machine learning. But strictly speaking, the optimization process is applied to the weights, the parameters of a generative model, the contingencies. So there's um, uh, there's one fundamental difference between reinforcement learning and uh, active inference in the context of belief updating. Um, I don't think that's quite the spirit of your question, though. So I think um, another way of looking at the difference between active inference and reinforcement learning um, is just in terms of the teleology and uh, asking what is it that you want to optimize. So in reinforcement learning, you assume the existence of a reward function, a loss function, a cost function, a value function, and then you optimize your neural network or your, um, your artifact um, to um, respond to any given um, either explicit state or inferred state with a particular action. That, and that action is chosen by the Bellman optimality principle to maximize the expected reward. So that presupposes the existence of a, a value function. Um, and if that exists, then by the Bellman optimality principle, you can then evince a, a, an optimal state action policy. Is that, um, is, can that be, um, com, um, if you like, um, framed in terms of active inference? The answer is yes, but as a very, very special case. So what is that special case? Well, it's a special case where you can reduce um, the, um, the function that is implicit in active inference, which is a functional of belief. So remember, you know, we're planning as inference, belief updating in terms of perceptual inference and, and, and um, uh, data assimilation, evidence accumulation, and all that good stuff, Kalman filtering, um, and the action selection via Planger's inference. This is inference. So, so the objective function is a functional a function of a function or a functional, and that function is a belief. So the objective function in active inference is uh, belief-based. So under what conditions could you actually reduce an active inference formulation of a problem to a bell uh, to the kind of problem the bell optimality principle would apply was when you shrink your belief down to have zero uncertainty so if you take uncertainty off the table then you can get back to a effectively a um the situ the, the uh, situations in which you can apply the bell optimality principle interestingly just for your entertainment the, the way that you do that technically is just by um describing your reward as a log prior probability of some outcome that you prefer. So we often call it a prior preference. So we say that every outcome um, is equipped with a reward or a loss function. So instead of having two separate channels, sensory information and reinforcement re information, we simplify the problem and say, no, every output, uh, every sorry, observation or sensory input comes labeled with a reward in aspect. So your reward function now um, becomes very high dimensional and continuous. Um, and uh, it's just basically the log probability of a priori me, me sampling that outcome. Um, and once you write that down and you take away uncertainty, um, then you can apply the Bellman optimality principle. So you can look at reinforcement learning as a special case of active inference when there's no uncertainty. The problem with doing that though is if there's no uncertainty, that means that the curiosity part of the objective, the expected free energy, is zero, which means that you've lost the opportunity now to simulate artificial curiosity and exactly the kind of sentient behavior that we were talking about half an hour ago. Because there is no information to be gained, there is no information seeking at hand, because you know everything. Why do you know everything? Well, because my, in my model of the world, in my reinforcement learning model of the world, there is no uncertainty. I know everything. I can see all the hidden states, or at least I can infer them. Um, so the, 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 you know, the, 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 what you lose by converting a, an objective function, which is a functional of beliefs, which is you know, the um, variational free energy or the marginal likelihood or the model evidence, all of these are usually logarithms of, or KL divergences, or free energy functionals of probability distributions, beliefs. Um, if you now try to you know, coerce that uh, into 
a function of states as opposed to beliefs about states. You take away all the epistemics, you preclude any proper um, discussion or treatment or account of artificial curiosity. In neurobotics, this would be intrinsic motivation. So, um, you know, the, the, intrin the, the intrinsic value, the value of information, the epistemic value of making that move. What would happen if I did that has its own, if you like, epistemic reward. But that part of the reward function, or sorry, more explicitly, that part of the expected free energy uh, or the expected evidence or the expected uh, surprise, um, that part has, um, um, uh, has been removed when you dispense with or you, 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 you try to cast the, um, um, the problem um, in terms of the Bellman optimality principle. Just a little technical, interesting technical twist here. Um, when, you, um, when you consider the full problem where you're dealing with um, functionals or probability distributions for us, Bayesian beliefs, um, you are technically dealing with um, usually path integrals because you're, as we've spoken about before, the, you know, our paths go into the future. Um, so the plan has, has a trajectory or a path into the future. So now you've got a path integral of a functional of a long, uh, uh, basically a log probability, which is an energy. So you've got a path integral of an energy, which is called an action, and you're trying to minimize the expected free energy, which is this, um, this action. So all you're saying is that I can explain sentient behavior with Hamilton's principle of least action. So now you're replacing the Bellman optimality principle which uh, applies to value functions of states with a Hamilton's principle of least action, which um, um, uh, deals with, if you like, value functionals of belief states or beliefs about, about states. So that's for me how I would see that there's a fundamental difference between reinforcement learning and active inference, but it's not a difference that should be overly celebrated in the sense you can get from one to the other. You can repair that dialectic, if you like, as long as you're prepared to take all the reducible uncertainty out of the game or, or off, the, off the table. Does that, is that a kind of yeah, answer yeah. you were? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm trying to understand one bit of this. Um, so when, when you say that in reinforcement learning, we actually know there's certainty. In reinforcement learning, sometimes we are not aware of the world. I mean, like many things could happen that could, like, you know, put obstacles uh, uh, on the path of our agent that yeah. could happen. But then the agent somehow learns to, you know, get out of them. Um, I, I don't get the idea of not having uncertainty in reinforcement learning. I didn't get that part. To say that there is no uncertainty in reinforcement learning would be disingenuous and, and, uh, and, and I, I think possibly for me most easily understood in terms of reinforcement learning um, being one application of um, Bayes optimality in the context of optimal Bayesian decision making um, with a loss function. So it was really it was really the nature of the loss function I was talking about. What I was trying to get across was that um, Bayesian decision theoretic approaches don't have as part of the loss function any reduction of un of, of uncertainty. So you have to build that in by hand, so that novelty bonuses or exploration bonuses and things. Uh, so you have to apply all sorts of widgets or, 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 or little tricks to, to make your, your, your loss function even treated under uncertainty in a, you know, in a Bayesian decision theoretic context or say a partially observed Markov decision process. Uh, you have to actually write in what you get for free if you start with an expected free energy or an expected um, marginal likelihood. Um, um, so it, it's the kind of uncertainty that matters in terms of what I believe I was talking about. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's a difference between, um, uh, you know, a, a neural network that's trying to be on target uh, for as much time as it can in a noisy, uncertain situation, for example, and a neural network that knows it doesn't know certain things that would enable it to find out uh, what uh, what what particular times it should be aiming for the target or from what particular direction because there are certain unknowns out there that it can actually um, resolve 
with particular epistemic moods that have this intrinsic value or this intrinsic motivation um, that give it this curious aspect. So it contextualizes the optimal Bayesian decision theory exactly by adding in the optimal Bayesian design principle we're talking about before, which is this, mm -hmm. uh, which is this sort of uh, information seeking aspect. So the, the full picture from my perspective or from the perspective of the free energy principle is that the, that you would you can decompose the objective function, the expected free energy, into two parts, literally linearly, um, into into you know an epistemic part and, and, and the sort of reward or pragmatic part, and that it's the epistemic part that disappears when you go straight for optimizing the reward function or the uh, or, or the your your prior beliefs. There's an interesting intermediate case. Um, which you can get at this by rearranging certain terms in the um, in the expected free energy functional, which is um, KL control. So this would be like risk sensitive control. Um, so so I'm not sure whether you put this under reinforcement learning or not. Um, mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd have to ask you. But but so from my point of view, this is a, an interesting middle ground where you've now included. Um, um, uncertainty about the consequences of my action into the game. So instead of now just trying to maximize the expected utility or the expected loss function or the expected reward under some belief about um, the consequences of action, I'm now um, going to minimize the KL divergence or the difference between what I think will happen, the outcomes that I under my posterior predicted density, um, technically, but more intuitively, what I think the outcomes will be if I take this plan or this course of action. And then I have this set of preferences that, you know, that, that encode my preferred outcomes. And then I just choose the action that minimizes the KL divergence uh, between the two. So this has uncertainty um, in it um, that is not quite the full uh, uncertainty reduction. But it certainly accommodates a degree of uncertainty um, when it comes to real world applications. Uh, again, um, I'm, I'm thinking about sort of engineering applications in control theory, where this would be known as KL control. In economics, it's called risk sensitive control. So that would be like um, a finessed reinforcement learning value maximizing scheme mm. that's got an uncertainty baked into it. And, you know, that, that's an interesting. Um, uh, halfway house between the sort of uh, vanilla expected utility, which I'm reading as reinforcement learning, plus possibly unfairly, um, uh, and the full um, the full sort of active inference um, expected mm -hmm. free energy. It's a really great game if you have time in terms of yeah. just writing down the, the you know the probability distributions and the, and just rearranging them to different kinds of divergences and just trying to read them as if you were an economist or you're a uh, an engineer, a control theoretician, or or your uh, behavioral psychologist doing reinforcement learning, or your neuroroboticist, developmental neuroroboticist, trying to understand intrinsic motivation. But by switching them around, you can get all mm -hmm. sorts of interesting different perspectives on on, on this sort of overall um, you know, expected surprise minimization uh, like um, objective function. I see. Oh, that was really amazing. So we talked about perceptual inference and active inference. Now, both of those ideas highly rely on the environment. One is modeling the environment and the other one chooses actions that would, you know, uh, maximize uh, the, the, the probability of my existence. Uh, now, both of them rely on the environment, but what about when we come up with some abstract knowledge that never existed before? Like the first time that someone thought about uh, the Wright brothers th uh, thought about an airplane, or the first time some someone thought about a mermaid. Um, so any time that something, if that's even possible, I don't know, the first time that something jumps into one's mind that never has existed in the environment, and they they try to make it into like create it uh, into reality. Uh, can we explain that part? The, the, um, knowledge generation with with these two ideas, uh, active inference or perceptual inference. 
Yeah, again, another very challenging question. Um, I, I would contend that you can. So I think you're touching now upon sort of um, the links between the mechanisms of um, um, the underwrite um, model optimization and to a certain extent curiosity, but more, I think, the notions of creativity and exploring different model spaces. Um, so we're now moving in fact, actually completely away from active inference and perceptual inference in terms of um, optimizing both the states and parameters of a generative model um, as it is exposed to data. And now turning to a third level of optimization, which would be the optimization of the model in and of itself. So um, in various fields, this would be known as structure learning, for example, in radical in, uh, constructivism. The problem of not, let's say, forget about, let's assume we've got the perfect scheme. If you give me a neural network or a generative model and, uh, uh, and a particular environment that can generate data, I can do all the good inference uh, or learning to infer um, actively and do all the planning as inference. And so we've got this little agent now um, coupled exchanging with their or her environment um, in, in, in a base optimal way. Now we move to a next level, hierarchically speaking, of a, a, an optimization or a free energy minimizing process, which is now not applied to the parameters of the model, but to the model itself. How many hidden layers? How many connections? Do you use rectified linear or sigmoid trans? You know, how do you carve things up in terms of not just hierarchical levels, but in terms of uh, you know, factorizing or mod putting modules or conditional dependencies at any level? All sorts of fundamental structural issues that you would practically have to deal with and contend with when writing down the architecture of your neural network that you know, will read as, as the structural form of your generative model. So this structure learning problem, in, um, from the point of view of a statistician, is a Bayesian model selection problem. Um, it's basically integrating the marginal likelihood over all the kinds of data that you could see or all the kinds of data that you have seen. And then you choose the model that best accounts for, um, that has the greatest evidence. So now this is a categorical act of selection of selecting the best model. And I use those words because this is mathematically, I think, an apt description of natural selection. So natural selection in evolution is just nature's way of doing Bayesian model selection, just selecting um, the hypothesis, namely the phenotype, um, where evolution thinks that this particular hypothesis is a good fit to me, the condition that I'm supplying. Um, and therefore the econish then selects the phenotype mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. through this process of the structural form of the epigenetically specified, for example, um, structure of the genetic model. Um, and as soon as you think of it like that, then, 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 then um, there's a big question. And the big question is, well, how do you explore the model space? Because we've just said, well, you're doing this Bayesian model selection after you've acquired the data. So now what kinds of model spaces would you, would you explore? Um, and um, is it necessary to explore? There is an argument, which we actually touched upon earlier on, that we can actually start off with a completely over-parameterized model and prune it. So this is a kind of Bayesian model selection, um, technically called Bayesian model reduction, where you just literally, if I remove this parameter or this connection from this model or this hidden layer from this model, would I have um, would I increase its, um, the pathological of its, um, of its evidence? Um, in other words, um, would, I be re would I be minimizing complexity without sacrificing too much accuracy um, with the kinds of data that this model is, is, fit, uh, is fit to explain? So, you know, you could argue that um, um, both the model expansion typically dealt with um, in a Bayesian context through non-parametric Bayes. So by having expandable models and priors of the way that you would add in um, different parts or chunks. So for example, in a hierarchical Dirichlet process, you might have some sort of stick breaking process on top of that, which says, you know, can I, am I, is it justified to bring in a new hidden latent variable or, you know, sort of uh, in, in my uh, Dirichlet um, uh, distribution. Uh, and you'd ask that question by basically um, evaluating the evidence for that model or the variational free energy um, with and without that extra bit. And if it, if it improves 
by adding complexity, which more than pays its way in terms of the accuracy, then you'd keep it. If not, you wouldn't. But you, you know, what the what the stick breaking process brings to the table is a is is a principled way of expanding or growing the model. Um, I repeat, in the context of non-parametric Bayesian approaches, but I think you can also you can also sorry. I think that both model expansion, um, and I'm reading that at the moment in terms of um, non-parametric Bayes, um, or from the point of view of natural selection, um, having recombinations of certain sort of codes um, or parameterizations of, of, of um, you know, uh, of, of generative models that you can think of in terms of split and merge like operations that you get in genetic recombination, ways of exploring a model space in a principle structured way, or, and the Bayesian model reduction, I think both can be seen um, as the processes that give rise to creativity and insight and aha moments. Um, so um, I'm, I'm saying that I'm uh, using sort of the notion of aha moments and creativity um, in um, deliberately, just to make the point that some creative acts are actually acts of reduction. It's not so much the fact that no one's ever seen this before, um, sorry, no one has ever represented or um, had this uh, you know, this um, object in mind before. It's just that no one's seen that connection before and that uh, it's actually a simpler way of viewing things. So if you just think about the most creative um, ideas and signs, they are not actually more complicated de novo constructs. They are simplifications that make sense of lots of other things. In fact, they are instances of the free energy principle itself, providing a simple account of, um, of uh, but accurate account of, of everything. Um, so it's really the, the simplification and the reduction, the increase in the evidence when you suddenly see that two things that you separately represented in say two parts of your network can actually be represented by the same thing. And you do that by removing bits of the model. So I actually think many acts of creation uh, certainly in sort of minimalist art forms, um, are actually getting to the bare essentials of what's going on. And again, in, um, you know, in compliance with Occam's principle and, you know, um, uh, you know um, amortizing the complexity cost of explanations for, for, for the lived world, that, that seems to me, you know, an important bucket of creative acts is actually just seeing the structure underneath, the, simpli the simplicity, explaining everything with just one canonical, platonic-like um, um, dynamical construct or narrative or, or, or sort of factorization, however you want you, you want to, um, however you want to um, 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 uh, articulate it. And in that sense, the first person to have that simple insight that oh, it's just one of those. This is just one of those. The first person is really the genius and the creative person, but they haven't created anything new. They've just seen something simpler. Uh, I see. Um, um, and, and in a sense, you know, that's I think that's the scientific process. That's exactly why we're having this conversation. That's what you do with your well, so what I do in my life, and I can guarantee what you do with your life. It's this journey of finding the simplest explanation for everything that we uh, that we experience, uh, and you know, leaving it as a legacy. Uh, you know speaking to the uncultured aspects of, of uh, or, um, that one could uh, appeal to to answer your question uh, for the next me, you know, my children or my students or whatever. So, you know, that's, I think, the most, you know, that's one way of looking at creativity. The, an interesting point that in, uh, ensues from that is that, um, you know, it is perfectly possible to be the first art, sentient artifact to see that simplicity um, that is actually in the real world. So it's not the qu a question really of making new things that aren't out there. They've probably already been out there. It's just you're the first person to have, uh, to, to be able to infer them in that simple ki kind of way. The other point to make here, of course, is, well, is it really out there? Well, probably not. This is your simplest explanation. It comes back, there is no true model. This is, this is the best explanation for what's going on. So you may be the first person to find this simpler explanation um, for, for what's going on. So I would put most of um, most of art and creativity in that in that bracket. 
uh, but then you could press me on music for example and, and uh, you know why is <laughs> why is music so attractive and well that, that would be another question maybe one of okay yeah questions. yeah perfect um so that was amazing uh, actually professor i was uh, watching one of your talks uh, actually it was 3 a.m as i was watching that and you said something that i mean my mom was sitting next to me and you said something that it was so interesting that i i it was like I got a nervous tick or something. Like, then my mom asked him, what happened? I said, he said something amazing. And I just want to share that with you. And just maybe we could dig a little bit deeper in this. Um, you said something along the line, if I'm, if I'm uh, putting this correctly, that the way our biological neural network forms itself tells us something about the environment that we're living in. In other words, show me your nervous system then I'll tell you about the environment you're living in. And it's fascinating to me because maybe a, a couple month, months earlier, I was discussing this, this gap between artificial neural networks and biological neural networks. And I was asking my friends that these distances, like why these axons are long or why not, or these dendrites, like we, we never sort of create those structural uh, foundations into our artificial neural network. It seems like very simplified version of those. What do, the, what do those features entail really? And when I heard the piece that you just said in, in, that, in that talk, it was just amazing. Now, in pre and, and you mentioned the idea of action in the distance and how light you know, reflects into our eyes and at that how that's how we have long neural you know connections in our like reflection of action the distance now in practice if we actually see and like actually in, in in a literal meaning if we actually see a ner the nervous system of of an of a biological being how much can we really say about the environment like is it really possible to to say okay probably it has these rules it has gravity it has whatever is it really possible yes uh, that was a lovely story <laughs> more interesting than my answer but yes yes i think it is you know, you've just convinced your listeners it is possible um and you've given some of my favorite examples but i'll give you a couple more just to uh, reinforce the point you're making um, I think the first thing, there's a couple of things before I um, get into this. Uh, you, you, you were noting that the architectures that um, have emerged in neural network theory and machine learning and latterly uh, deep learning um, um, have a very simple architecture that is, if you like, that is inherited from neuronal networks. And that's a good thing. So remember, simplicity is good and inheriting from neural networks if you want your machines to deal with the kinds of things that human beings deal with. But those are two good things. They may be a bit too simple, but I think there are certain architectural features that you can actually spot, which actually would allow you to apply your law that you've just suggested. Give me a neural network and I'll give you the world that that neural network is fit to explain or act for. Um, that law... Um, is um, um, uh, another law um, from Ross Ashby. We mentioned the law of requisite variety before in the context of natural selection. Um, but he, um, with colleagues, also formulated the good regulator theorem. So I I'm not sure whether, whether you're probably too young, you're far too young to remember this, but this is, this is um, um, was taught as one of the fundaments of the inception of cybernetics uh, you know, in, in the early 19th, uh, 20th century. So the, law, the, the good regulator theorem, which you can, you can wiki, you know, there's a wiki little wiki page, basically what it's saying is that if any artifact, and from, from um, Ashby's perspective, this would be something called a homeostat, which has all this sort of you know, regulatory uh, aspects to it that we talk about. It, if it regulates its environment, basically it does the, the right kind of active inference and, and, and you know, it controls the latent states out there in the right kind of way to survive, then it must be a good model of that environment. So he was, uh, you know, he purportedly or thought that he could prove that, and in fact, you know, I've, I've read the paper where where he proves it. It's not an easy read, but <laughs> if you have uh, uh, three a.m. in the morning with nothing else to do, you should try and read his, his original <laughs> proofs <laughs> and see see if you're convinced. Um, uh, but the, the key point is that this is a very old idea, um, and and probably uh, you know a, a very true idea that anything that um, exists um, 
um, in some kind of generalized synchrony with its eco niche, its environment, its heat bath, its world, its uh, um, climate, uh, must effectively be a um, uh, be a good model of that climate, which simply means that the architecture, the structure that we were referring to in terms of structure learning, must in its function, in its structural form, recapitulate the causal structure of what's out there. So the structure of the Gerringer model um, will tell you an enormous amount about the, the, you know, the kind of world that is generating the sensations that are being used to do the planning as inference to control that particular world. So lots of great examples. You've given one, one I think, one of, the, one of the most interesting ones, which is why is the brain, um, why does it have an architecture that involves long thin communications at a distance and then the liver doesn't and the liver does a wonderful job at doing its job and presumably complies with the free energy principle and doing its own kind of active inference in a world of um, chemicals and met metabolites so you, you you've, you've given you've given um, the viewers the answer it's just that that must imply a certain kind of conditional dependency um, that has this long range action at a distance uh, and, and, and of course we, unlike um, thermostats and worms and viruses, really have to live in a world where there is action at a distance in the sense that I can hear you from Dublin, I can see you from across the room. Now, viruses, worms and thermostats can't do that. They are, they, their world is, 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 you know, is much more immediate and disreliance upon the conditional dependencies that are related to the juxtaposition in symmetric space. But we live in a much more complicated world that has this action at, at a distance that that actually is necessary to explain the kind of sensations that we that we have to explain particularly sort of vision and and, uh, and audition conveyed by waves of one sort or or another or another sort um so i think that's a wonderful example but you can go even further to sort of course the grain do you know you just look at the brain and it's uh, and it has two hemispheres that tells me immediately that the embodied world of this particular brain has a bipedal symmetry yeah so you know if the world includes the body then i can tell you almost immediately that the kind of creature you dissected this brain from um, the the part of the world which is most important to that to that particular brain or neural network namely the body that embodies it it can move around uh, has has a bilateral symmetry will probably have two arms and two legs and uh, and all that good stuff if on the other hand you gave me the brain of an octopus i'd be able to tell you immediately because they have a brain for each arm it has an eightfold symmetry so i can tell you a lot about the the world and in, 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 you know in this instance the you know the, the bodily world uh from just the gross morphometry but you can go much much further uh, I could look at your brain and I will find two streams that emanate from the visual parts of the brain. And I will know that they're visual parts because your eyes are part of the central nervous system and I know that they're, they're photoreceptors. So I will know that they're somehow um, trying to explain the causes of sensations um, um, in a visual scene. And I will find two streams called the dorsal and the ventral stream that, that sort of run eventually in this direction and dorsal, uh, dorsal in this direction and eventually uh, towards the, the hippocampus um, um, more eventually from here. And that tells me immediately that there's been a factorization, there's been some sort of uh, fundamental carving nature at its joints in terms of the causal architecture of this creature's world. And in particular, what I will be able to discern is you must believe that so the, the, there are uh, the objects have at least two attributes um, in order to um, um, produce their impressions on the nervous system in the words of the Helmholtz. And of course, those will be what and where. And I'd be able to tell you that you, the, the typically the kind of visual objects that you're trying to explain um, um, will have these two attributes that are conditionally independent because of the physical separation and the un- the, the sparse connectivity between these two streams. Um, so um, you know, the, the, what we're saying just in common sense terms basically means for the typical visual objects that we usually look at, 
knowing what something is doesn't tell you where it is and 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 me telling you where something is doesn't tell you what it is so it is the most efficient simplest minimum complexity representation just to represent, represent the whatness and the awareness and then you put them together to explain this thing in this in this location and the, another nice example of minimizing the complexity by using the minimum degrees of freedom when carving up the world uh, you know, in terms of being a good model of that world. But you see exactly the same kind of, um, if you like, factorization and effectively weight sharing in convolutional neural networks, which brings me back to, you know, don't, don't be dismissive of your CNN, your favorite CNN. It's got some beautiful factorization uh, in it. So the, the very fact that you've got this weight sharing and this sort of way of carving nature at its joints um, in the context of what you see emerging in convolutional neural networks is that you are now saying that there is some causal structure out there that has local continuity or contiguity aspects that I could leverage to provide a really simple explanation for these kinds of data. So as soon as you tell me I'm using a, a CNN, I know exactly what kind of data you're using. You're using stuff that has certain regularities in the metric space, spatially extensive, uh, so sort of image-like data. If you give me another kind of uh, neural network that looks like a transformer network, I know you're not doing that. I know that I now you're trying to deal with things uh, mapping one uh, set of categorical uh, objects onto another set of categorical objects. So just by looking at the structural form of even, I think, um, sort of uh, canonical um, architectures in deep learning, um, you can tell a lot about the, the causal dependencies, the, independent, the conditional independences that generated the, the kind of data that you're trying to classify or um, auto-encode. I see. Professor, this has been amazing. So the final question, the last question, um, that is going to be a very non-technical, I, I hope, like, like a simple and nice question for to, to end this talk, a light question, um, that I'm sure many people watching uh, would be interested to know your opinion about. Will we ever fully understand how the brain works? And how far have we come at the moment? Right. <laughs> a simple or, or question. Is, or, or is it a, <laughs> a long, a long, a difficult one? I, right? I, I appreciate your attempt to ask a light, a light, fun question. <laughs> <laughs> I have to. I tried. The lightest question that one could ask. Um, I think we've come an enormous way, and there is there is an enormous way to go. Uh, and I think there are some principled issues about the understandability of ourselves that actually get into some deep questions about consciousness and metacognition and the kind of creatures we are, and of course, the kind of curious creatures we are and have to be in order to exist. Um, so I'm thinking here of, um, <laughs> of things like uh, David Chalmers' meta problem or meta hard problem. So now in philosophy, the question has moved from away from what is it like to be or to see red? Red. Why do we spend all our time puzzling about the fact that we can see red or experience things? And uh -huh. of course, that speaks to this hierarchical model or generative model, where parts of this generative model now have a construct of meanness, and meanness in particular experiential contexts, um, hence the metacognitive aspects when you think about very deep generative models. I'm so I'm sorry, think what, is, what do you mean by meanness? Oh, that's selfhood. Uh, oh. The idea that you want. So you have something which you could argue um, many um, lower forms of life, possibly not dogs and cats, but sort of possibly birds don't have. Um, you have a part of your generative model is a hypothesis or a fantasy that you are a person and that you are in charge of orchestrating your perceptual inference in your deep generative models and moving and secreting. Now, you don't need to have that um, hypothesis or explanation in order to function quite viably as quite a sophisticated being, like a bird, for example. But you have that, which suddenly creates the opportunity to think about counterfactual ways of me being. So when I said me-ness, I just meant me in inverted commas, ness, uh -huh. uh, or uh -huh. self okay. Yeah. Oh, beingness. Sorry. I, I, okay. Okay. I, I, okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Sorry. So. Gotcha. Yeah. 
you know, just your question, that, you know, will we ever be able to understand ourselves? I think um, it's a lovely question in the sense that it, the answer to that may um, hold the secret um, uh, to um, awareness and, and particular self-awareness, me awareness, selfhood, um, and what particular kinds of generative models you would have to have in order to even ask the question, um, am I a self? And then the philosopher's question, can I understand myself? These are really, really very, very literally deep problems that rest upon yes. deep hierarchical generative models. I see, perfect. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Friston. It was indeed an honor to have this uh, talk with you. I really enjoyed it. I hope that I didn't try uh, tire you out too much. It, it, I know it, 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 took, it took a long time. <laughs> it did, uh, and I'm exhausted, but thrilled to have spoken to you. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor. And I'm truly, truly sorry for taking too much, because uh, taking too much of your time, because it's like one interesting argument brought another one, and then it brought another one, and I apologize for that, but it, it was well, a priceless it, it, experience for me. Well, thank you very much. We could have gone on all night, but now I, I'm worried about all your editing you're going to have to do. To, <laughs> to get. But that's your problem, not mine. I'm going to have a nice Yes, exactly. Problem. Exactly. Thank you so much. Have a lovely no. evening. Thank you so yeah. much. Bye.